Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome back to my shop. This is part two of our extensive shop tour. So I'm leaning on what's the heart of most everybody's workshop. This is a, a saw stop. I would do a commercial for these guys for free. This is such a good saw. Not just the safety feature, but the way it's built. It is literally a Sherman tank behind the scenes. It is uh, rugged, accurate, large tabletop. It incorporates the traditional Biesmeyer fence. Just an excellent excellent saw. This is a three horsepower industrial model. So this is the biggest one you can get. The only step up is that you can get a five horsepower, I think maybe even a seven and a half. But really, unless you're running the saw all day long, three horse is fine. Never stalled it. Works great. And we have tripped the cartridge a few times. The guy that works for me actually got his finger into the blade one day and uh, it only took a couple of minutes to go get a band-aid and close a little cut in the end of his finger and he's back to work. So if your digits are important to you, get yourself a saw stop. Okay, so this a little more work in progress. These are our uh, these are our wood hinge drill jigs. So these allow you to make the wood hinge box that I'll show you when we get on the other side. And we're just putting the last of ten together. We sell a lot of those, and we're out of some components, but that's all we've got right now. This is a, a general 12-inch jointer. I, uh, I actually bought this from a prison that was closing out their woodworking program, which I don't think was a very smart move, but since they were selling it, I bought it. I took the head out of it that had the straight, four straight knives, and I put in the segmented head that I showed you earlier, which is, it will fit. It takes a little bit of messing around, shimming it in order to get it just right, but it is an absolute fantastic, probably the best thing, outside of saw stops, probably the best thing that happened to power tools in the last 50 years. Great machine. These cabinets were a project that we did in the power tool workshop just before we did the base cabinets that you saw in the first half. And uh, let me explain what I was doing here. I went through and I made uh, one, two, three, four different styles of doors. That's the reason why the fifth one never got finished because it was going to be the same as this and we didn't film it. So like the drawers that are waiting to get done in the base cabinet, that door is waiting to get done. So this one was done with a shape, not a shaper cutter, but a match cutters from a router bit, which is a uh, uh, coped joint with a raised panel in there, all solid birch. This, uh, let me start over here. This one, these two were simple. They were just quarter inch plywood panels. What I did is this is kind of a, an open mortise and tenon or haunched where this piece comes all the way through. This one is mitered with two splines, make nice strong joint. And nice thing about this is if you had any decoration on the inside, because it's a mitre, you carry that decoration all the way through. Whereas over here, you'd be bumping into the side of long grain. It makes it difficult, if not impossible. This one took the most time. This has through wedge tenons, very strong joint. The panel is, uh, I don't know if you can see this little detail, but there's a chamfer that stops right here and then picks up again there, which is kind of fun to do. Way too much work for a shop, but it was fun nonetheless. Now, continuing along this way, this is my uh, my general lathe. Again, General Canada. This is a variable speed lathe, which is really nice because it's uh, DC, so you can control it. You can take it right down to a couple of revolutions per minute, and, and I wouldn't spin something fast with that on there, but it'll go all the way up. Really rugged. It's got the riser block on it, so you've got quite a bit of capacity. In fact, 12 inches, and it's got an outboard as well, which means you can turn on the back side, and there's a separate uh, piece that fits on there with a tool rest designed to work on the opposite side. And there's my turning tools, more cabinet storage up above, some of the finishing supplies over here. This is where we store our plywood, and we're just in the process of trying to get these to fit in, but it's nice, it's close, and... What else can I say? You got to have sheet goods. These are dovetail saws in various forms of being finished. Actually, these are cro uh, the new bench cross cut and medium tenon. This is uh, a finished medium tenon with the uh, no. This is a this is the option of a white oak handle. Our standard handle is this one, which is a black composite. We call it ebony resin. And then these are an upgrade that you can get, and then you can go even more with the uh, fancy handles. These over here, in case you didn't see, are a bunch of handles. These will be Kerf X10s. This is for finishing a, um, a half-blind dovetail. And then if you just want to see a bunch of parts, 
One of the things that I like to do is build is make the uh, the wood the tools that have the fancy wood. So this is uh, various uh, marking gauges. This one is Bacote. There's one out of um, ebony. Actually, you know what? That one's not ebony. That is a piece of Brazilian rosewood that I found in a uh, in an uh, not a, where did I find that antique store? It was it was a level. And then there's a piece of uh, fiddleback catalpa. These are all the handles we've been working on. These are all the nuts and bolts and bits and pieces. Here's the handles too. I cut them out and then sit them in here until I f I'm in the mood. This is a, this one is uh, um, Paduke. And I have a friend named Sean down in Pennsylvania that resin impregnates some of the handles for me. So they put it in a vacuum and they take all the moisture out and replace it with some kind of a polymer resin, which plasticizes the wood. And on some woods, it, it's, it really is amazing what it does to them. And it increases the weight, which is the big thing. All right, moving along. This is uh, one of our my recent acquisitions. This is a 20 inch, 24 inch bandsaw made by Poitra. Now Poitra was another Quebec company that was uh, bought out by General, and General absorbed some of their designs and and kept them alive. And others they closed off. But I, I love this saw. It's uh, kind of strange because it's got an open back. There was no way of effective dust collecting. So I did a video on this dust collecting system that we built for it. Very simple, but you hook up your vacuum cleaner to that and you never get a speck of dust anywhere. This, is, uh, this has a five horsepower motor running it, which is way more than it needs, but better too much than not enough. Now I'll show you this. This is a, a chop saw and all I use this for really is, is r rough dimensioning lumber. It's a, it's a nice 12 inch Bosch, but this hood, this is a Rousseau 5000, and this is great for containing all the dust. Uh, everything goes in there, we've got a hose in the bottom that goes to our central dust collecting, so it's just, what, these can, things throw dust everywhere, this is fantastic. If you're looking for something to uh, really control the mess, particularly if you're on a job site, because it's easy, the whole thing collapses all down together and packs into a little bag, we leave it set up there permanently. Okay, so this bench you're looking at, this is the very first bench that I built, did this my last year at BYU. This one has the uh, traditional uh, tail vise that I was telling you about. Took forever to build, and then when we moved back, now here I am with a belt sander on a uh, hand tool bench, but the reason is, this is where I do, I can get that out, this is where I do the brass for our saws. So once we've put the uh, once we have put the steel into the brass, we drill, peen, and put in or pardon me, flare the hole, put in copper pins, peen them, and then I sand them flush over here. But this I had to when I moved back from Utah. I don't know how many times I had to take this apart and just scrape it so that everything would work. If you could see up underneath, there's a whole. Uh, framework made out of wood so you've got pieces that if they swell the least little bit it jams it up and if you allow too much slop then it, it ends up being real sloppy itself. Anyway, this bench is, really, is usually a catch-all. Um, something else we're working on in our hand tool workshop we're, design, we're using an old design of a military, a collapsible military bench Here's some pictures of it. We're just modifying it a little bit. But we, we need some sawhorses in here, and I wanted something that could be folded up and put away so we didn't have any less room than we have now. So we're just kind of in a prototype phase right here. This is all the wood that I can't stand to throw away, so it just keeps accumulating. It's a killer. I showed you the clamps in the last class, but I, I just want to show you uh, some of our wood hinge boxes. This is the stuff that I don't get near as much time as I'd like to uh, work on. Now here's one that was a reject, but I'll show you how it works. Now this is a simple three piece. It's a reject because there's a big piece of wood missing right there, but it's a nice neat system. I did a video on it and I usually do a whole bunch of them at once. I haven't got around to finishing them. Here's one that we did uh, several years ago. I'd love to get this finished. And to do a little bit of a twist on dovetails, the box, are, the pieces are mitered. And then I used the dovetail saw to cut through the slots. And then I took some uh, ebony veneer 
and uh, pound it to make it thin enough, slid it in to the slot, applied cyanacrylate, which allowed it to swell a little bit and tighten up, and it outlined the dovetail, but kind of a neat way of strengthening a joint. And on this particular one, the actual hinge will sit on the outside. Uh, let me show you, because I did on the bottom one. Haven't got this one finished yet either. So there's the, there's the hinge as it works when you have, leave it on the outside instead of flushing it off on the back. And then the idea was that I would take the exact same wood here, uh, cut it in three pieces, and the middle piece would stay attached to the top, so you would open it up, two little pieces would stay on the bottom, and when you would close it, it would all go back together again. That's the plan. I've done them before, so I know it works. Just a matter of getting around time to do, getting time to do it. Now, if you look up here, these are all various projects that uh, have never been completed. I teach classes, and the project we were doing, I'd work along with the students until Friday when I'm trying to help them get finished. So I'd end up having stuff that never got completed. So there's a couple of traveler, 17th century French Canadian traveler's chests that aren't done. Over here, there's various other projects in various stages of being completed. I store lumber up above, I store lumber over here, I've got a bunch of veneer up in here. I've got some redwood, I bought some big redwood beams and had them milled so that uh, I could use them, it's hard to come by. And if you look around the perimeter, there's lots of planes. When we shot the video on, on uh, reviving an old plane, I had to get a lot of practice in, so I bought oh, more than a hundred planes off of eBay and went through and did the process and fine-tuned it. and then eventually videotaped it. Uh, what else have we got to show you up here? Oh, some more drill presses. These are uh, more general drill, general products. I think I have five general drill presses. Very expensive when they were made, but nice and accurate, and very little run out in the quill. The biggest problem with drill presses today is when they're wound down, there's so much run out in the quill, it's not very accurate at all. Well, on the generals, you can actually take that run out out by just squeezing this in, and you don't have that capacity on most drill presses. These, this one is set up just to do one function. This is the one we use for drilling our mallet heads. So when we make our mallets, we start with a block. In this case, is a piece of uh, babinga. That's what this big piece of uh, 12 quarter babinga is for. It weighs a ton and a half. That'll all be cut up. And we also do maple ones, and Sean does these one for me as well, where he resin impregnates them, and increases the weight of that piece of maple probably by almost double. And it makes it extremely hard, so when you hit it, it doesn't dent like you would normally do. And this is actually a soft maple. So I drill these, that's what that sits in there for, and then Dave uh, turns the handle and puts them together, and, and you buy them. Uh, this quick look here, we are constantly making saw boxes. Dave, the fellow that works with me, does does all the saw boxes. So he is uh, he spends probably two thirds of his time every week making over here saw boxes. That's where we put our saw in. Started putting that foam in just in case they break loose inside; they don't get destroyed. And that stack of boxes won't last more than a week and a half. Okay, I think that's about it for this floor. We're going to do one more episode. We're going to take you downstairs and show you what we have down there. So we'll see you shortly.